Good afternoon. Welcome to NPC's webinar, Same Condition, Different Costs, Should Patients Pay Different Amounts? I will now turn the webinar over to Dr. Jennifer Graff and we will get started. Great. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are, and thank you for joining today's webinar. As Tanya mentioned, I'm Jennifer Graff, Vice President of Comparative Effectiveness Research with the National Pharmaceutical Council. Right care, right patient, right time. Much of our focus on value has centered on the premise of precise, personalized, and nuanced care. Yet when it comes to health insurance, we pool the risk and health care costs and spread it across groups of consumers and patients, the health plan members. That's the very nature of insurance. And as health plan members, which I'm sure many of us are as employees, we pay for this care in multiple ways. First, we pay through premiums. Second, we pay through deductibles, in which members must typically meet a certain threshold before the insurance starts paying for care. Third, patients and members pay through cost sharing, where we pay co-pays or co-insurance for each doctor visit that we go to or medication that we receive. And so while much of the focus has been on the increase in health care costs and premiums, and the growing use of deductibles and high deductible health plans. What's often forgotten is that cost sharing is still an important factor. Now, if we think back to when cost sharing was designed, it was meant to encourage more informed and efficient treatment choices, such as the use of lower cost generic medication. But today, the number of formulary tiers has ballooned, and the difference in out-of-pocket cost sharing between tiers has widened. So let me show you some data. So if you look on the far left, patients are taking generic, medica taking generic medications, pay on average $11. However, for patients on a drug in the specialty tier, they will pay on average about $102, about a nine-fold increase. And if they're unlucky enough to have a medication with a coinsurance, patients will pay a percentage of the list price, typically 25% of the cost of the medication. So let's just assume that you have a specialty biologic with a list price of two or three thousand dollars. The cost of the medication to the patient could be several hundred dollars. Now we all know that higher costs cause us all to pause and think about whether or not we want to use, utilize these services. Research has shown that when patients pay more, they decrease the use of both the inappropriate care and even appropriate or high value care. However, cost sharing is typically calculated on the tier and the cost of the medication. And many times it misses whether it's the right medication for the right patient in the right setting. It's typically one size fits all cost sharing for all members that receive that treatment. So what would happen if we take the current one size fits all approach to pharmacy benefits and use a more precise, personalized, and clinically nuanced approach to benefit design? Well, as we think about this, it's not just us that have been talking about it. Recently, the New York Times editorial was very supportive, as you can see quoted on this slide. What would happen if instead health plans offered more generous benefit coverage, but less generous coverage for those services that provide little or no health benefits? And when we talk about more generous coverage, we're often referring to the cost that the patient pays as well as logistical burdens that they may have around, such as prior authorization, step therapy, et cetera. So this New York Times article tees up what we'd like to dig into further today. We want to understand a few thorny issues. First of all, when is it acceptable to have different out-of-pocket costs for the same condition? When is it less acceptable? What are the trade-offs when making these decisions? from different stakeholder perspectives? And what stands in the way of precision benefit insurance design? So to help us tackle these issues, I'm pleased to introduce our esteemed and external speakers. Dr. Mark Fendrick will provide a justification for moving from a blunt coverage policy, Flintstones era delivery system, to more nuanced precision benefit design. Dr. Fendrick is the director of the Center for Value-Based Insurance Design, or VBID, at the University of Michigan. And as anyone who has had a chance to hear Mark speak, you've heard his passion for VBID as a leading advocate for development, implementation, and evaluation of innovative health plan benefits. 
Second, Dr. Helen Sherman will be speaking from the health plan's perspective. Dr. Sherman is the Chief Pharmacy Officer at Solid Benefit Guidance, a division of Arthur J. Gallagher, where she helps pharmacy benefits and employee benefit organizations advance the best use of medications. I've known Helen for some time, and she's been a strong advocate for using evidence-based medicine as a foundation for decision making. Prior to coming to Solid Benefit Guidance, she spent 15 years in the health plan pharmacy benefit industry as Vice President and Chief Pharmacy Officer for Regents Rx. And finally, Cheryl Larson will share the employer perspective. Ms. Larson is the Vice President at Midwest Business Group on Health, a leading national employer with over 120 self-insured public and private employers. They provide benefits for over 4 million individuals. There, Cheryl leads the educational and networking events focused on health benefit management, including programs such as the National Employer Initiative on Specialty Pharmacy and Value-Based Benefit Design Research Series. Mark, Helen, and Cheryl, we are pleased to have each of you with us on the phone today. So to help kick us off, let me turn the microphone over to Dr. Fendrick to describe why today's era of precision medicine needs precision benefit design. Jennifer, thank you very much, and it's an honor to be on a panel with uh, Helen and Cheryl, true experts in benefit management, and I thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to uh, listen in to today's webinar. I have been uh, in the field of value-based insurance design for a very long time. I just wanted this slide to linger for a second to let everyone know that my slides and <clears throat> everything that you ever want to know about value-based insurance design you could find on the website here, vbitcenter.org. So um, looking at the broad uh, stakeholders on this call and the expertise, I think it's uh, pretty clear uh, that innovations to prevent and treat disease have led to impressive reductions in morbidity and mortality. Uh, both uh, Helen and I are clinicians, and I, I like to tell audiences, as I did this morning in D.C., I did not go to medical school to learn how to save people money, but instead our goal is to improve individual and population health. Uh, that said, I think most of us would agree, although today might be a new day in healthcare transformation in the U.S., clearly cutting healthcare spending is the principal focus of healthcare reform in that um, it seems like policymakers want to do us to do less of everything at lower cost. However, if you were to ask yourselves what we should be spending our healthcare dollars on across the entire spectrum of care, you would find that all of these quality metrics, visits, diagnostic tests, drugs, and treatments – are systematically underutilized. And if we think the issues that we're having now are a problem, I think some of you might have heard the FDA approve the first drug that is going to be made for a single person and all these ex unbelievably exciting innovations that will allow us to improve the health of Americans. I think our ability to deliver high quality care is lagging and is going to get worse uh, behind this scientific in innovation. Jennifer stole a bit of my thunder, but I tend to uh, mention the amazing science that's going on in labs, both in universities and the private sector at Star Wars Science. But if you think about the healthcare that uh, myself and my clinical colleagues are delivering, you'll see that is uh, more like in bedrock with Flintstones delivery. And it's my view that the, the chasm between the science and the delivery is actually likely to get larger, not smaller, if we really don't turn our attention to ways uh, to better the way we could get uh, evidence-based interventions to our patients. So I mentioned the issue of cutting spending, and I think all of you know that. And, and obviously, one of the key levers, uh, both in the public and private sector, is to increase consumer cost sharing, and, and Jen talked about a bit. Uh, people refer to it um, as skin in the game, as a popular lever to achieve this goal. And I, I do want to go on the record to say uh, I do support uh, the use of high levels of cost sharing but I only want it to be used in those situations when uh, patients need to think twice or thrice about the services they need. I, I don't want to have one of my patients to get take out a second mortgage or uh, have a bake sale to be able to access a therapy that's specifically designed uh, to a genetic test to treat their situation, whether it be something like familiar hyperlipidemia or a, a cancer. This is one of my really important key messages is that Americans do not care about drug prices or health care costs. What they care about is what it costs them. And I think that as we start to talk about health care spending in general, while 
prices of services is much more uh, above my pay grade, I think we can do a better job addressing uh, what patients pay out of pocket for clinically indicated and in some situ- situations services that are not clinically indicated. And you see on this slide uh, that lowering out of pocket costs, not total health care costs, is a top priority for Americans. So Jennifer mentioned that cost sharing, uh, with few exceptions in the U.S., are one size fits all or blunt instruments. And it should come as no surprise to anyone. Uh, if you make people pay more for something, they'll buy less of it. And unfortunately, because high cost sharing is on both the good stuff and the bad stuff, as Jennifer said, uh, our studies and many others have shown that uh, increasing cost sharing uh, impacts both high and low value services. And this problem of cost related not adherence, which has been identified in public and private carriers, uh, worsens health disparities and adversely f- affects health, particularly among the most vulnerable, whether they be financially or have multiple chronic conditions. So what we have been trying to do, and, and uh, while our kids will not know what it is to sound like a broken record, certainly Cheryl Larson knows that I've been saying this for now for nearly two decades, that what we really need to do regarding cost sharing to make sure that we preserve the good stuff but make sure we don't buy the bad stuff is a smarter cost sharing approach one that identifies the billions of dollars of of health services research and clinical research to encourage consumers to buy more of the high-value services and providers through lower cost sharing and discourage the use of the low-value ones, such as the ones that are identified uh, in the Choosing Wisely program. And what you need to implement this type of smarter cost sharing is this concept of clinical nuance, for which you could find a lot more information on the VBIT Center website, but it basically distinguishes that um, although just about 90% of, of insurance plans make individual beneficiaries pay the same for every office visit, diagnostic test, and prescription drug, I think almost all of you would agree that some office visits are more important than others, some diagnostic tests more important than others, and certainly some prescription drugs within a drug tier are more important than others, uh, such so that I often mention that in most specialty drug tiers, of which Dr. Sherman is an expert, Americans face the same coinsurance whether it be a targeted immunotherapy which has a 90% cure rate or a palliative third-line therapy that doesn't cure any cases at all. And that is why we're arguing that people understand that different services in a particular category, like on this slide, may have different values. But it's important also to point out that even if you identify a service to be high or low value, it's really, really important to understand that no service is, is always high or low value, and the value depends on who who receives it, when in their course of their disease, which we'll talk about later, uh, who provides it and where. Uh, This applies to drugs. This applies to procedures. This applies to screenings like colorectal cancer. And I think all of you could realize that imagine if we had the perfect antibiotic called cefakilamol. If you gave it to a person with a bacterial infection, it would be high value. And even though it's the perfect bacterial killer, if you gave it to a patient with a viral infection, that same perfect drug would be low value. And this is just another example of how we have to really think about important clinical information before we determine whether a service should be pushed through lower cost sharing or deterred through higher cost sharing and other levers. So we implement this idea of clinical nuance through this concept called a value-based insurance design. And I was very pleased to see Jennifer also mention um, a recent New York Times article just from a week ago Monday, kind of again mentioning the intuitiveness of the idea, the fact that it has been implemented by hundreds of public and private payers in various forms, and it's one of the very, 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 very few healthcare reform ideas uh, with bipartisan political support. So uh, this is just an example. I've, I've stopped adding organizations to this list, but there are very few healthcare reform ideas that have support of management and labor, health plans and, and pharmaceutical companies, uh, consumer advocates and practitioners. Uh, we are very fortunate to have threaded the needle, so to speak, to be a idea that's kind of transcended the bipartisan and rhetorical uh, debates through the healthcare transformation discussion in this country. So specifically, uh, application of value-based insurance design ties to this idea of the title of this webinar about uh, who gets a particular intervention when in the course of their disease. And we call this concept precision benefit design. We've called it dynamic benefit design. We've called it reward the good soldier. Uh, But the concept is pretty much the same, is that advances in precision medicine uh, may specify immediate use of targeted therapies 
nullifying recommendations to use a standard, perhaps lower cost first line therapy. Second, uh, as most of you know, is that if you think about the chronic conditions for which we spend a great majority of our healthcare dollars in the US, these conditions necessitate multiple therapies to achieve desired clinical outcomes. So if you think about diabetes or depression or heart failure, or HIV, it's extraordinarily unusual that a patient will be able to stay on one drug for many years and get the outcomes they want. That being said, just about every cost-sharing uh, strategy that I know keeps the cost-sharing for a specific drug fixed, and they don't rely on uh, the varying nature of these clinical conditions. And as most of you know, and Jennifer has showed in other slides, that as you go from one tier to another in a healthcare formula, you typically have to pay more. And in my view, patients are actually, you know, criticized or penalized for the fact that they've done everything they could and done everything their clinician asked them. And at the same time, when they step through a particular therapy, uh, they get penalized in terms of cost sharing and prior offs to uh, access clinically indicated treatment. So what we are proposing is something called precision benefit design, one that removes administrative barriers and lowers cost sharing for those who diligently follow the required steps. And this might be stepping through a generic, this might be passing through a class due to a genetic marker. And what we believe why this is a, a better way forward from these one-size-fits-all or blunt instruments that Jennifer Graff mentioned, first and foremost, it commits to established policies that encourage lower-cost first-line therapies. Second, it enhances access to effective therapies, but importantly, only when clinically appropriate. Third, it increases access to recommended treatments by removing barriers like prior offs and lowering cost sharing. And maybe most importantly, moving forward, it supports precision medicine initiatives by encouraging use of targeted therapies, again, only when clinically indicated. So it's my hope as I finish on the next slide that we're going to be able to capitalize on the exciting innovation that we see but also bring the delivery system, the clinicians like uh, Dr. Sherman and myself, into the Star Wars situation that will be able to uh, deliver the care we need to the patients who need them, when they need them, at a price they can. So with that, Jen, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Mark. That is a compelling case to justify why higher out-of-pocket costs may not be desirable for all patients. Well, that brings us to the project that NPC undertook. We wanted to answer two questions. So when is it less acceptable to have different cost sharing for patients or groups of patients with the same condition? So if we look at that $11 versus the $102, when is that appropriate? And if we want to align out-of-pocket costs, when and how should we do this? How do we adjust premiums, deductibles, or cost sharing? So to answer these questions, we used a multi-phased approach. First, we engaged a series of experts to develop an ethics framework, actuarial analysis, and legal review. And we engaged with thought leaders from the payer, employer, and patient community, of which two have joined us today. On the roundtable, we used the white papers that were developed in the first phase to bring together leading experts to tackle the key questions we outlined. And today, we're at the engagement and dialogue. And that's where you as the audience come, come in. A key piece to this dissemination was the publication of, in the Journal of Managed Care and Specialty Pharmacy in the July 2017 edition. You should have links to the publication in the infographic in your webinar registration today, but I'd like to take a chance to thank the participants in the first two phases. First, the co-authors who really rolled up their sleeves to develop the white papers. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Chuck Sheed, who led the project during his time as the NPC Health Policy Fellow. Among the roundtable participants, we had a mix of advisors representing the patient community, employers, payers, PBMs, and consulting groups. You can see their names and affiliations here. Needless to say, the roundtable was interesting, exciting, and lively. And it was a really valuable part of the process as we voted, then we discussed, and then we voted again. And that discussion really led to where, to an understanding of what is the cult what are the policy options that all of the different stakeholders coalesce around? Despite the diversity of the group, there were far more areas of agreement than I would have expected from such a diverse group of stake stakeholders. However, when you ask a group, a very thoughtful group, thorny topics, it's helpful to put some guardrails around the conversation. 
So to do so, we identified four case studies as prototypical case studies to help identify the trade-offs. So what were these four trade-offs? We looked at two cases that, case studies that were based on biology and two case studies that were based on preferences. So just as a word of warning, these were highly simplified case studies, and in, as in life, details matter. We provided additional detail to the roundtable participants and in the article appendix, but let me briefly su summarize these here. And you'll want to pay attention because we'll be seeking your feedback on each of these examples shortly, asking you to rate whether or not you think it's acceptable for patients to pay more for higher out-of-pocket, higher cost treatments. You'll have the options for yes, it's acceptable, um, or identifying those in which it's least acceptable. So first, let's look at the case study of step therapy. So for rheumatoid arthritis, those of you that are clinicians or have dealt with this disease know that there's treatment guidelines that recommend initiating with a generic first line prior to more expensive specialty medications. The cost for generics may be $120 a year versus $18,000 to $25,000 for a specialty agent. However, only some patients may benefit from the lower cost of generics or may only benefit for some period of time. And other patients with rheumatoid arthritis may require higher cost, higher copay specialty medications. In this case study, is it acceptable for those patients that have tried and not had successful results to pay more? The second biology case study had to do with the growing number of conditions where there's a valid diagnostic test. That diagnostic test result indicates whether a patient is a good candidate for a particular treatment, either due to the efficacy or the treatment safety. An example of this is patients with cystic fibrosis who have a specific mutation may be better candidates for a new specialty medication, Ivactifor, which improves outcomes compared with usual treatments. But it's at a higher cost and out-of-pocket expense than alternatives, 300,000 versus 20 to 30,000. So in this case, is it acceptable for patients who have had a genetic test that indicates a more expensive treatment may be most appropriate to pay more? The last set of examples are around patient preferences. We know patient preferences play an important role in whether a patient's start treatments, they continue with treatments, and whether the treatments help them achieve their personal health goals. So to understand this, we looked at two areas. First, preferences to avoid a particular side effect. In this case, we used tre treatment of fibromyalgia as an example. It has several different treatments, and each has a different side effect profile. Some patients might prefer to avoid the risk of headaches, nausea, or diarrhea, However, the cost for alternatives treatment is about a $1,000 difference. In this case, is it acceptable for patients who prefer to avoid these side effects to pay higher out-of-pocket costs than patients who use the lower cost generics? And the last case study looked at preferences for how the patient gets the medication, either by route of administration or how frequently they need to take it. In the case with osteoporosis, there's a biannual injection that may be preferable to some patients versus an oral daily, weekly, or monthly treatment. The cost difference for the injection is about $1,600 per year and is typically covered on the specialty tier, where the oral is typically costs about $100 and is on the generic tier usually. So in this case, is it acceptable for patients who prefer to get, prefer how they get their treatment and how often they get their treatment to pay higher out-of-pocket costs. So this is where we'll open it up to you and we have a poll where we'd like to get your feedback. You may select all that apply and the poll looks like is now open. So we had step therapy is about 50% uh, diagnostic test, 56, side effects 40, and uh, route of administration 35. So let's take a look at what the round table had to say. And keep in mind, they had a lot of additional information. So as you're looking at the following graphs, what you'll notice is during the round table, round table participants were able to vote with a more nuanced scale, uh, one to seven, where one to three was unacceptable, or patients should not pay more out of pocket for the higher cost treatment. So what you'll see is more 
more red, the less acceptable the current cost sharing is. Conversely, green means that the roundtable participants felt it was acceptable for patients to pay different amounts. Status quo is OK. So similar to the roundtable, you can see that many of more of you and the roundtable participants both felt the two biology case studies were more acceptable. However, on the call today, we saw far more acceptability for out of, higher out-of-pocket costs for fibromyalgia versus osteoporosis. Now, you may be thinking, well, what's going on with the yellow on the roundtable participants? There was a fair amount of yellow. And as it turns out in the roundtable, details matter. And I'm sure many of you were eager to get additional details about these case studies as well. In the roundtable, we learned about the detail and changes to the case, case examples that would tip their response. And this led to five guiding principles. So let me tell you about these five guiding principles. And I'll walk you through them one by one. Principle one, try and fail is important. So roundtable participants felt we should lower out-of-pocket costs for patients who had unsuccessful trials with prior treatment. This came up really clearly in the rheumatoid arthritis example, where patients had tried and not had successful treatment with lower cost treatment. But it also came up when patients had tried lower cost treatments and experienced side effects. So a bit different than the third case study. Especially, roundtable participants felt that this was important if the side effects were significant. So in these cases, there was more agreement on the panel that these patients should have access to higher cost treatments at a lower out-of-pocket cost, a strategy Mark referred to early, earlier as reward the good soldier. However, there's prior little evidence about what treatments work best for which patients. So try and fail spreads the benefits across members without compromising health and raising total health care concerns. And this really leads us to the key issue of what are the benefits? And the second principle, benefits should be certain and significant. So a good example of this principle arose in the cystic fibrosis case study where the genetic test predicted a benefit. It was tried and true. However, the cystic fibrosis case example is a bit more problematic because the roundtable participants really sought endpoints that were dealt with functional outcomes, such as uh, lung infections, rather than surrogate endpoints or lung tests. It was also really important to the roundtable participants that the benefits of the treatment, of the higher cost treatment, be significant. For example, in the rheumatoid arthritis example, where typically we'll use percent improvement in arthritis scores, roundtable participants wanted to see 70% improvement, not a 20% improvement. So in general, when the higher cost treatment provided health benefits that were significant, meaningful, and certain, panelists believed it was more important to lower the patient out-of-pocket costs for the higher cost treatment. When it didn't provide such benefits, status quo was seen as more acceptable. And this brings us to our third principle. Costs must align with these benefits. One of the most frequent comments at the round table was how much cost for how much benefit. For example, in the osteoporosis example, round table participants recognized that higher cost, less frequent medication was likely associated with greater adherence, which could lead to fewer fractures, and therefore fewer hospitalization, rehabilitation stays, and decreased costs. However, in this example, the increased cost did not outweigh the benefits. And in other examples, panelists were more likely to consider altering out-of-pocket costs if there was strong evidence. And I think this is a feature that will come up in the discussion later on. So we've talked a lot about benefits and evidence. But one of the key issues was fairness that came up in the ethics framework. And this rang true in the fourth principle. Don't penalize patients for bad luck. Higher out-of-pocket costs are associated with bad luck really out, arising outside of the patient's control, and it can take many forms. However, panelists were less convinced that cost differences due to preferences should be eliminated, and they wanted evidence that patient preferences affect outcomes. When patients had bad luck based on their biology or genetics, roundtable participants had greater sympathy. 
And so in these cases, cases that are associated with bad luck, biology, or genetics, rather than preferences, panelists believe higher out-of-pocket costs for higher cost treatments with clear efficacy was less acceptable. And this really brings us to our fifth and final principle. Lower but do not eliminate out-of-pocket costs. In the actuarial analysis, we adjusted premiums, we adjusted deductibles, we looked at cost sharing for all members um, regardless of what conditions they have and cost sharing for all members with a particular condition. And we started with the premise that employers really can't pay much more. And you'll hear more about this from Cheryl Larson shortly. So we looked at three ways. Should we increase the premiums for members? Should we make it neutral for all members? Or should we change the cost sharing structure? This is one area that the roundtable participants did not come to any agreement on. They felt it was, should be a blended approach, but blended in which way? How much premium? How much deductible? How much cost sharing? There was little agreement. However, where there was strong agreement was that completely eliminating cost differences for higher cost treatments was not desired. Cost sharing has an important role to encourage patients and providers to start with the lower cost treatment. And they felt that this should be preserved. Now, I just presented four case studies that we discussed in the roundtable and in the white papers. We could have looked at 40 or 400 case examples rather than the four. Hopefully, these five guiding principles can help answer the first question. When is it less acceptable to have higher out-of-pocket costs for patients with the same condition and start to delineate some of the trade-offs that need to be considered? The more of these guiding principles, that are met, the more that we need to develop precision benefit design as outlined by Mark. And when fewer principles are met, perhaps status quo is acceptable. But now that I've outlined these examples, Helen, why don't we'd like you to talk about what are the goals for payers when designing these benefits and thinking through these different elements? What features were most important for you and for other payer constituents at the roundtable? Hello. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, first, I want to thank Jennifer, yourself, and PC, and uh, my fellow panelists, very honored to be a part of this conversation and this work. So just as some basic grounding, as I'm speaking to the payer perspective, I'm coming at this from the health plan perspective. But there's significant overlap between uh, the thoughts I'll be sharing and what Cheryl will be sharing, because employers are ultimately, generally, the, the final payer and a, the key client of the health plan. Payers' approaches must align with employers' goals uh, and means. So just is some basics um, that are important to clear in terms of how health plans work. Coverage is funded by pooling money um, from employers, individuals, and government sources. Uh, the amount of funds needed is always an estimate, and it's a fine line between uh, figuring out that target or estimate and making sure there are adequate funds. Funds are limited. And while most health plans have sufficient reserves for good and bad times, those funds are limited and the exits of exchanges across the United States the last couple of years are an example of when um, the finances are not sustainable, uh, health plans cannot survive. So health plans need strategies as to how to use the money available. The most basic part of uh, the framework for that is the health plan, uh, benefit contract, the contract between the payer um, and shared with ultimately the member or the patient, and then researching, betting, and coming up with various innovative approach to fulfill the obligations. So those are the basics of the payer um, from a health plan perspective. So health plans clearly strive to um, align co-pays with value. Value is not universally defined um, in the healthcare space or the payer space. Generally, health plans put health improvement um, versus other options as the <coughs> key weight, uh, the key driver for what drives value. But when there's not a difference um, between options or one can't detect it either from science or actual clinical practice, then cost becomes a part of the equation. So as we have this conversation about variable co-pays, um, 
some of the work that we've done already is um, a little bit outdated because the market is changing so much. Um, predominance of high cost, um, high tech specialty in biologics is taking over. And the reality with the prices of those medications and the requirements under the Affordable Care Act, the majority of patients that get high cost medications are likely to hit their uh, max amount out of pocket max. So they still pay a lot out, but the value of variable copay effectiveness um, is somewhat diminishing, especially in this arena of the high tech, high cost products. So the change from, I mean, copays are still going to be a mainstay, variable copays, they shouldn't be thrown out. There's still a significant place um, in the medications that have been out, the, the non-high-tech um, medications. But in terms of where the future is going, the main method that can delineate value and coverage is various types of coverage policies whether it's in the contract, what's covered, or other means, such as medical policies. So these are really becoming the mainstay of how to determine what's covered and uh, aligning value with coverage. Payers certainly uh, use evidence um, as a primary authoritative source to determine effectiveness, safety, and value. However, um, it's becoming more rare, especially with the newer pharmaceuticals that are coming out, that there are direct comparisons. Um, and safety studies are rare. So we rely on what's available and apply extensive judgment. So the consequences of rating premiums or co-pays, well, I mentioned there are limits to funding. There's always a dilemma of you know, how do you spread the money out, uh, especially when there, uh, a high-cost medication comes out that's a million dollars per patient. What does that do to the rest of the population? How do you spread the funds out? Do you fund uh, less of the common diseases to fund these rare diseases or some of the challenges? In terms of just to move us forward, and it, it really is a pivotal time, we, we do um, change how we approach this. Getting um, you know, alignment and commonality across everybody that uh, puts into the um, funding process. Um, Evidence is unclear. So changing benefits and changing approaches takes time. And really, the most ideal way is to come up with some pilots where there are um, input and conversations and alignments across various stakeholders. So just to think of an ideal state um, in aligning patients' medical needs with coverage, um, it's likely in the new world of pharmaceuticals going to rely more on judgment and subjectivity weighed from a patient and a clinician. So it's not going to be black and white, and different conclusions can be drawn by different parties. So there needs to be some parameters around that. Would advocate that uh, pharma is a party to the value equation. Um, it's not the only way, but some possible uh, avenues are having pharma be uh, a part of the funding process with some type of warranty um, for when uh, products work and don't work. So we really do need to go beyond what we've done historically. Pilots are the way I think um, we can have some breakthroughs, but we don't. There's still a place for a tried and true tested methods such as Larry's copays and step edits that we've used um, for medications that are longstanding and crucial. So with that, I will turn it back to um, Jennifer. Great, thanks, Helen. Now. Helen just talked a lot about the contracts and bringing different stakeholders around. Cheryl, the employers, and in your case, self-funded employers, they're the ones that are paying the ultimate bill. So I'd like to ask you a similar question. What are the goals for employers as they're selecting benefits? And what features were most important in the case studies with you and many of your member employers that joined us at the roundtable? Thank you. So I'm going to very quickly go into uh, the bullets because I have an employer case study I want to share at the end. But obviously in an employer environment, the goal is uh, to maintain a healthy, satisfied, and productive workforce. Productivity, we represent a lot of manufacturing firms as part of our employer coalition, is absolutely key, and that translates into cost savings. Um, we know that employers have a role 
in educating employees. Uh, we have coined the term benefits literacy. Most or many employees and their family members don't understand the uh, summary plan descriptions. Uh, we as employers are not necessarily marketers. We didn't go to school for that. So uh, having a, a robust reinforced sequence communication strategy, especially on things like adherence, medication adherence, treatment compliance are absolutely critical. Next bullet. You can just, uh, I, I agree completely with our previous speakers about um, evidence-based um, care. It's so important whether it's going to be the pharmaceutical manufacturer community, it's going to be the PBM community, it's going to be other communities are going to help us determine what the um, highest quality, safest drug is. And I recognize that that's going to be challenging in this environment, but we've been waiting as employers for many years for that kind of information to help us make smart decisions. Uh, and we also want to look at value-based models. And I'm going to share one, a couple with you actually, that, that um, use the value-based benefit design model similar to VBID, um, but more utilized on the employer side, that, that really look to share the outcome value between the consumer and the employer, the value of the medication. And then I wanted to just a reminder to all of us that uh, the, the, the so prominent use of high deductible health plans with higher co-pays and co-insurance um, can maybe support cost management efforts, but only in the short term. And we're seeing uh, a lot of small to mid-sized employers out of desperation go into these models without implementing them correctly. And people, as we know, are not getting needed care. Uh, communication and teaching them how to be smart consumers is absolutely critical to that. Uh, and, and we want to make sure that, as I said earlier, that they are happy and healthy and um, are productive at work. So one of the, uh, using value-based benefit design models is really one of the few levers employers have to help them better manage costs and, and patient health. And I think this is going to become even more prominent. You know, we looked at the Pitney Bowes model and many, many of the diabetes management models over the years that have successfully utilized this model by reducing or waiving co-pays uh, in, in exchange for the good soldier to comply to their meds and follow a certain treatment guidelines, but I think we're going to see a resurgence of this uh, as we see the, uh, the significant pipeline of specialty drugs uh, that will continue to come into the market, especially as more of the, these products populate a specific drug category. Uh, and and it's, um, because cost is a factor, we've got to really uh, look carefully, though, uh, with cost and productivity at our high deductible health plan. One of my employer members um, is taking one approach, and I'll share the other approach. One is taking the approach of serving as their own pharmacy benefits coordinator. They only use the PBM for claims processing, and they do direct contracts with pharmacies. However, they only offer generics. They have their own on-site pharmacists and doctors, and if somebody requires a specialty medication, that team reviews what the options are and then does a prior auth on that. They're saving a lot of money doing this, and that is a very streamlined, bare-bones model. Let's, let's look at a model that's a little bit more, uh, well, a, a lot more open, but really is helping to manage costs in a different way. And I think both models have value depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, and the other employer, it's a large employer. They've had this value-based model for well over 20 years. Uh, as Mark calls it, using high-value services through a value-based design, and they don't have a drug formulary. And drug formularies are driving so much of what uh, uh, PBMs and plans and employers are doing today, and that's really gotten us in a, in a tough situation because uh, I've learned over the last five, ten years that most formularies out there are not based on clinical efficacy. They're based on how much of a rebate the manufacturer gives the PBM. And I think even manufacturers have gotten caught in this loop of paying these rebates that are often not going back in the hand of the, uh, of the employer, which was the original intent. So this particular employer has four different categories of uh, drugs and what they will cover, what the employee share is, what the employer share is. So lifestyle-enhancing drugs that enhance a person's ability to achieve a lifestyle-related goal, and examples of that would be maybe a weight loss aid or uh, an ED, erectile dysfunction, or even cosmetic uh, drugs. Uh, either all of or the greatest amount of the cost of lifestyle-enhancing drugs 
uh, is assumed by the consumer, the patient, the employee, not by the employer. Convenience drugs might produce an outcomes that are not directly associated with preservation of life or normal functioning of the body systems that are essential to life, um, and, or there might be medications with uh, less costly treatment options. Uh, and examples of that would be non-sedating antihistamines, acid reflux drugs, um, hormones like progesterone, progesterone and testosterone, toenail fungus cream, some sedatives. The consumer and the employer uh, will at least share equally in the cost of these drugs because there's value to both sides. Uh, the other two categories are life preserving. And so these are drugs that are directly associated with the preservation of life or functioning of the body. And this might be infections, pain, seizures, even depression and cancer. And so the employer is assuming the greatest amount of the cost for those drugs. And then finally, the one that ties the productivity element that is so critical in an employer environment are the business preserving drugs. And those are the ones used to treat controllable chronic health conditions that result in the highest level of lost work time and long-term disability. And so examples of those would be your chronic conditions like hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, and asthma. And, and an employer uh, will, will pay for the vast majority of that. And this is significant, this is similar to previous years of value-based benefit design or the diabetes model where if you agree to comply to your meds and, and do these one, two, three things, we will either pay for the majority of your diabetes drugs um, or we'll waive the costs altogether. Um, currently, about 5% of our employer members that we've surveyed are doing various forms of this value-based design. Um, we asked them this last fall, but we also said, would you consider implementing this? And 45% of the employers indicated yes. Uh, if you want to learn more about these models, you can go um, to the online employer toolkit that uh, is part of our National Employer Initiative on Specialty Drugs at www.specialtyrxtoolkit.org. And then uh, there is a, an employer case study on there called Employer Journey that, that talks about this entire model. I think it makes a lot of sense and it ties in very well with much of what we're talking about here today. Um, we've already heard that the majority of uh, payers in this country, uh, the majority of the stakeholder paying for health care costs is, is the employer. That's about 56%. And um, we, we would like to see us all working more effectively together to keep employers in the game. And that means every key stakeholder, because as of now, the, the employer is paying the majority of health care, and it's not going to be sustainable for them much longer. So each stakeholder is going to have to work with employers to come up with solutions like these to get where we need to go. Um, one of the biggest initiatives we're working on with employers right now is uh, looking at PBM contracts, and, and they are really one of the um, biggest middlemen in the pharmacy benefit space in terms of how much money they're making uh, that they're not sharing back with the employer. So um, uh, things will change. They need to change in the future, and we all need to work better together. Thank you. Thanks so much, Cheryl. I think what you just outlined, especially in that latter case study, is taking the five principles, actually adding another principle around the productivity, and really operationalizing this. So let's jump in and tackle a couple of these questions that are um, coming through. Um, so one of the questions, and I think maybe we can do it just as a real quick short yes or no. I think based upon your discussions, um, we can all speculate on where you will be, but should differential cost sharing be eliminated? So let's just go round robin real quick. Mark, yes, no, Helen, and Cheryl. I, I'm not sure if it, the question was a double negative. I, I support differential cost sharing. You support differential cost sharing. And Helen? Uh, echo what Dr. Fendrick said. And, and Cheryl? Yes, I do support okay. it. Okay. And so you've also just outlined some of the ways that if we could build patient cost sharing from the ground up, what it would look like. So one of the questions that came in is around evidence. And, and Helen, you mentioned this a bit. Is there sufficient evidence available today to help many of these trade-offs? And there's a sub-question that we'll get to as well, but let's just start with the evidence initially. So, and this is my, from my editorial view, um, 
generally the evidence is not black and white. So it's not going to give the answers. Um, and if the more certainty we want out of the evidence, the higher level of evidence we need to require. But it's not going to be the silver bullet for these decisions. It's certainly important, um, the best information we have, but it's not the answer, generally. Again, to, this is Mark, to, to quickly add on. So each of those five principles, um, all of which I, I've been talking about for years, there is uh, small evidence within each one. So for instance, the value of the drug that works better with a genetic marker is higher than one that doesn't. The value of a drug when there's not a cost alternative is certainly higher because there is no longer alternative. So I, I think that's a, a too broad question to just say it depends. I, we shouldn't let the perfect get in the way of the good in the fact that for each of those principles, there's um, at least some strong evidence to support part of it. So one of the questions... If I could Go add uh, to that, you know, the industry, is, as, as was alluded, is rapidly changing. Um, there's, a, there's a new MS drug on the market um, that is proving to be much more effective for one type of MS than the other, and um, it's coming to the market at significantly less cost than the 12 or 14 drugs that are out there. But again, employers are going to struggle because that the formulary is going to be based on the rebate that the PBM is getting, and it may not make it on formulary, but it's the most efficacious. So we as employers and stakeholders need to really be looking at the game-changing drugs that are coming in the market and encourage manufacturers looking at how they price their drugs. So Cheryl, I'm hearing this, it has to do with coming oh. down on the market to see what's coming down so we can have those thoughtful dialogues. Helen, you mentioned all stakeholders need to be at the table. So if we say that, yes, we think that there should be um, ways that we think about cost sharing for patients, what's holding it up? And is anybody outside of Cheryl's example doing this? So Mark, do you have any examples of anybody applying the VBID principle that you have in place? So um, as many of the listeners know, uh, basic, what we call VBID classic, <laughs> If you take certain classes and, and subsidize them over others within the tier of the formulary uh, has become fairly ubiquitous. But there are um, some employers that have put this soldier model in place in the fact that they lower, not low, a cost sharing for drugs in the specialty tier if and only if they uh, completely comply with the first line therapy and not uh, respond to them, or if there's a clinical indication suggesting that they should bypass the first-line therapy because of these specific situations, such as the one Cheryl just mentioned in multiple sclerosis. So, Helen, you deal a lot with national plans, and you've dealt with plans that reach across many states. Are there any regulations or things that you need to go through if you did want to implement something like this? Uh, lines of business, summary of benefits, things like that, that that make it more complicated? And if so, what else is holding it up? Yeah, I, and I'll just provide some uh, a simplified view of, um, yes, there are re requirements and regulations. First, you've got the government funding Medicaid and Medicare, where these concepts don't fit into those requirements uh, for the health plans that are contracting with those entities. So. It requires, um, you know, a changing, um, uh, something to change the regulations, which takes a lot of time. And then on a local level, there's state insurance um, agencies that uh, health plans need to uh, respond to. And it's kind of the same thing. Today's world is not built around this. You have to start a conversation. You have to provide rationale for why we have to change. And these kind of changes take minimally probably two to five years to change what's been in place uh, for rules and regulations. Uh, Cheryl, so the employers also have to then uh, talk to their employees about this. So can you tell us a little bit about how your organization or some of your employee, employers uh, in, within your coalition are working on consumerism and educating patients and employees about health literacy? 
So I think that um, employers that have implemented high deductible plans correctly have had a robust communication strategy, but let's face it, the majority of employers in this country, especially those that might be self-insured but small to mid, um, being driven by cost savings only, you know, they're just implementing a model with a really high deductible, and again, people are not getting needed care. So uh, communication is, is critical, um, but I think that um, we, we included in, in the, on the online toolkit a communication strategy for employers to have dialogue with their employees and family members about what specialty drugs and biologics are and why it's important to adhere to them and, and why they cost more. So some basic guidance because nobody is talking about that. So there's a communication campaign on the website. But um, I think that it's absolutely critical that employers open their eyes and start looking beyond, you know, it's going to take a long time to, to change certain policies and legislation as, uh, as others have, have mentioned. And uh, so employers really, really need to look at their PBM contracts again um, and, and, uh, and start having a, a broader voice in saying, you know, we're not, we're not going to do this it, th it this way anymore. And so we're trying to help them understand what other options they have available. But, but I just have to share quickly that model that I shared, those, I mean, this is obvious, but, um, but sometimes I have to say it for people to have the aha. By saving all that money for convenience and, and lifestyle drugs, they're preserving those funds for the business preserving and, and the life-threatening diseases. Uh, you know, people wonder how, well, if I make those changes, how am I going to fund it? That's how you're going to fund it. And these people, especially employees that or employers that implement value-based designs, uh, you, you implement it correctly, you educate, you reinforce, they understand it. They're part of the solution as well. Great. I think that's really helpful. So I think we need to wrap now because we're coming to the end of the hour. What I heard is that precision medicine requires precision benefits. There's five principles, actually maybe six or seven now that uh, uh, Cheryl added along to, and that there's many trade-offs that we need to think about if we're going to ensure that patients get the needed therapies and waste and uh, choice are uh, perhaps funded through different mechanisms as we deal with um, health care costs. Um, that are rising. Thank so thank you to the audience for your thoughtful questions. And uh, many thanks to our speakers, Mark, Helen, and Cheryl. Uh, for any other information about this research or others, uh, please uh, reach out to www.npcnow.org and be on the lookout for an evaluation to tell us, give us feedback on this webinar and what additional topics you'd like to hear about in the future. Thank you. <laughs>